One of the best things about Spring is how configurable and flexible it is as a framework. Spring apps are designed to be wired up in any way you need, and a huge part of that configuration comes from good old properties files. You use property files, either application.properties or application.yaml, where you save property values, and then you can inject those values in your code dynamically at runtime. So suppose you want to externalize some configuration for your business logic, you put them in property files, and then you inject them into your code. But there are some special properties that actually configure Spring itself under the hood, right? These properties tweak how Spring works and Spring Boot works, things like the server port, the database URL, logging levels, and so much more. And out of the many Spring Boot properties for configuring Spring, there are some that are so commonly used, they're absolutely essential for you to know as a Spring developer. You'll encounter them time and time again in almost every app. So in this video, I'll be covering the eight of the most essential Spring Boot properties for configuring the framework's behavior. These properties make Spring Boot really so easy to work with. So learning these properties will help you level up your Spring Boot knowledge. Whether you're a beginner looking to get started on the right foot, or you're a seasoned pro who just wants to round out your knowledge, stick around as I'll uncover eight essential properties that you absolutely have to know as a Spring Boot developer. Let's go. Kicking off this list at number one is none other than server.port. Now, you can guess what this property does. Every Spring Boot application comes with a web container, like a Tomcat or a Jetty or a Netty, that needs to run a web application on a certain port. This property configures the HTTP port that that container will listen on. By default, Spring Boot will try and run on port 8080. And if you like port 8080, then you're good. You don't need to use this property. But nobody likes defaults, right? Especially if you're a cool Spring Boot developer. Anyway, so if you wanna change the property, all you need to do is slap a server.port property in your application or property files or application or YAML file, and now we have customized the port. So for example, setting port, server.port as 9090 will run your application on port, you guessed it, 9090, instead of the default 8080. It's as simple as that. But the real benefit comes in when you're dealing with microservices. So let's say you split your monolith into multiple Spring Boot services. Now imagine you run more than one of them on the same instance. They're all going to try and run on port 8080, and all but one of them are going to fail with the error. Oops, sorry, the port is in use. What you need to do is to have each one of them run on its own port, and now you know what to do. Just give each one of them a unique server.port, and now you've got dedicated ports for all of your services. You don't have to mess with any other configuration. You can have your Eureka service discovery run on 8761, your gateway run on 9191, and your backend services can all run on their own ports, all configured for just one property, which is why this essential property snags the number one spot on our list. Coming in at number two, we have spring.application.name. As you may have guessed, this handy property specifies the name of your Spring Boot application. By setting a name like user-service, you identify the service name is user.service at runtime, right? No more figuring out what application is doing what. Spring will even print your application's name as it starts up so you can see the application name in the log when an instance is starting. Now, you may be wondering, well, isn't that what a project name is for? During development, each service has a unique project name, right? But remember, project name is only relevant during development. Once you build and package the jar, the project name is left behind. At runtime, it's just a plain old jar. Of course, the jar has a name, but it could have like org names and versions and whatever else. So this is where Springer application name comes into play. By setting this in your properties file, you give each of your services unique identity that sticks around at runtime, not at development time. So for example, any logging that your service needs to do is identifiable by the service name. Now this may seem simple enough at first glance, but as with many things with Spring, the magic comes with microservices. When you have, say, 15 different Spring Boot services in your architecture, distinguishing them in the logs becomes very critical, right? So with this application.name uniquely identifying each service, all the logging and monitoring solutions can neatly separate your metrics, they can separate your errors, separate your log statements by the service configured name, right? Service discovery can happen with the service name as well. We 
it basically just opens up a lot. So spring.application.name brings order and organization to your microservice ecosystems. So you know exactly which service you're looking for and you can pinpoint issues quickly. As a result, this property earns the number two spot on our list. Rolling in at number three, we have the Spring.data source family of properties. Now, as you can guess, this controls how Spring Boot sets up connections to databases. If your Spring app needs a data source, you can configure where the data source is, what the credentials are, how the connection is made, and so much more. You have properties like Spring.datasource.url for configuring the data source URL, as you can guess. You have Spring.datasource.username for configuring the DB username and of course spring.datasource.password for the secret password. Well, I know, I know. In practice, you wouldn't store passwords in property files for production instances, but the other key properties like data source URL, you have driver class names and usernames, they're all super common. They're used all the time in real world applications. So setting just these few spring.data source properties takes care of all the boilerplate code that you would have otherwise had to do for data source configuration, right? So add all your data source specific, database specific properties and that's it. Spring Boot will handle creating those connections using those details automatically, right? Spring handles that grunt work so you don't have to. Just give it all the details of where your data source is. So this benefit lands the spring.data source family of properties at the number three spot. Rolling up next at number four, we have a set of properties called the spring.jpa. And what is JPA? It's Java Persistence API. It's an ORM specification for saving Java objects to relational databases. Spring Boot commonly uses Hibernate as the default framework for JPA implementations. And as you can expect, Spring.JPA properties configure how a JPA provider like Hibernate behaves, right? How it maps objects to tables, which is what ORM is all about. So for example, you can have a property called spring.jpa.hibernate.ddl-auto. It automatically generates tables from entities on startup, which is super handy. You throw in annotations on your entities, and then you set this property. Hibernate is gonna look at your classes and create those corresponding tables in your relational database on startup, which is very, very useful. You also have properties like show SQL, which is useful during development time. This property tells Spring to log every SQL query that Hibernate actually executes behind the scenes. It's super useful for debugging, right? No need to try and guess and figure out what query Hibernate is using. All you need to do is flip the switch and watch SQL show up in the console. In real world applications, these two properties tend to be used a lot. You set it in the property files and then database schema generation and SQL logging is controlled. And with zero code changes, you can do things like turn off and on SQL logging in production, which is property file changes, which is useful when you have troubleshooting issues. So the spring.jpa namespace has some fairly simple but fairly powerful properties to tune your JPA provider. So make sure you're aware of them so you can configure your database interaction between your Spring apps and your relational databases. All right, number five, we have the Spring.Jackson properties. So for any REST API developers out there, Jackson needs no introduction. It's literally the best JSON parsing and serializing library for Java out there. And this is what powers JSON serialization and deserialization in Spring by default. So what can you configure at Spring.Jackson? It's a lot of good stuff. So for example, there is a Spring.Jackson.serialization set of properties that let you control how the Java objects are serialized into JSON output. One super useful property that I use all the time for developing and testing your services is Spring.Jackson.serialization.indent output. What does it do? You can probably guess from the name. It enables pretty printing JSON output for readability. You might think it's not a big deal, but when you're making test calls during troubleshooting and during development, and you're examining the JSON response, this property is so useful. It saves a lot of time. It makes your response so clean and you can read it. Of course, you wanna turn it off in production because as you can imagine, it adds a whole bunch of white spaces to the payload and it makes it a little more verbose, a little less efficient when you're dealing with production workloads. So use it for development, it's super handy. Here's another property, Jackson by default 
outputs date in a timestamp format. What if you want to use date month year, for example? You use spring.jackson.serialization.write dates as timestamps. You set it to false and you're done. And now Jackson is not going to render timestamps, it's going to render dates. Another property is spring.jackson.date format to customize how the dates are formatted in JSON. So for example, this string year, month, date, hour, minute, second tells Jackson that this is the format you need the date in, right? You can also set the time zone using the time zone property. In summary, spring.jackson is useful for customizing the JSON output for your Spring and Spring Boot apps. And that's the reason why it lands the number five spot. Because guess what? As Spring developers, we're gonna be building a lot of JSON APIs. Cruising into the number six spot, we have server.servlet.context path. Now, what does this guy do? Well, it sets the context path for your Spring app, acting as kind of like a prefix for all your HTTP request URLs. So by default, Spring apps listen on the root context, which is slash. But with server.server.contextpath, you can actually change that. So for example, setting it to slash API would make your app listen on slash API instead of slash. So a request that would normally hit an API like slash books would now go to slash API slash books. It's pretty handy, no? This is especially useful when you're versioning REST APIs. How? We'll just stick a version number in this property and you just deploy a new version. So you can have your old instances running on API slash v1 slash books and your new instance running on API slash v2 slash books and so on for each API version. And in microservices land, this property really shines. You can give each service its own unique context path and basically avoid collisions. So your book service could be running on slash books while your user service is on slash users. So you have clean namespace for every service thanks to this simple context path. Spring.servlet.contextpath lets you customize your Spring app's context seamlessly. So you set it once and you can have versioning, you can have namespacing for your REST APIs and it's pretty cool. So this is the reason why this is on the number six spot on our list. Making its debut at number seven, we have Spring.security family of properties, the Spring Security Config properties. And we can guess what this does. It configures Spring Security magic under the hood. So you have properties like spring.security.user to set the user account details. You have spring.security.oauth2 for setting up OAuth2 client connections for example, social logins through external providers like Google, Facebook, or GitHub. The OAuth2 client registration set of properties are very useful for setting up these OAuth2 apps and external logins. So for example, OAuth2 client registration, Google client ID, and Google client secret would be used to configure Google's OAuth2 login credentials. And speaking of safety, spring.security.session management set of properties control session behavior for your apps like session timeout, maximum number of allowed sessions, session fixation protection. You can also do things like limit concurrent logins. You can avoid session hijacking and a whole lot of stuff. You can have session creation policy set to stateless to ensure that your application does not maintain session state entirely. And there are so many more properties you know, properties for cross-site request forgery, cars headers, SSL, you name it. Spring Security does a lot, and these properties expose all those little knobs and dials. So this spring.security namespace brings this kind of configuration to Spring Security capabilities, and that's the reason why it's on the number seven rank. Closing out our list at number eight, we have management endpoints Web exposure include a property that solves critical issues with Spring Boot Actuator. What is Actuator, you ask? It lets you monitor and manage your Spring Boot apps, especially in production. It does this by exposing certain API endpoints, and these are called system endpoints. These system endpoints report key information about your running application, like health checks, application info, metrics, you know, if you have any scheduled tasks, and so much more. This is important when you have running applications deployed in production and you wanna know how are they doing, right? Think of it like a control panel for your app. You can also hook up monitoring tools to these endpoints to kind of keep tabs on your application in production. So Actuator brings this production grade visibility, which is essential for any real world app. But there's a catch. By default, all Actuator endpoints 
are disabled and they expose zero information because while these endpoints are really useful, they provide some handy information, some of it could contain sensitive internal data that you wouldn't want regular users of your app to access. So by default, the Spring team has made a decision to turn off all of these endpoints. It kind of defeats the purpose, right? So that's where this property comes into the rescue, right? Management endpoints, web exposure include. What this property does is lets you selectively expose only the actuator endpoints that you need for your use case. So for example, setting it to health comma info would expose just two endpoints, health and info. Other information like app status, the version info can all be safely exposed to provide monitoring visibility without compromising security. You can selectively expose them. You can expose additional endpoints like metrics. You can have log file, ENV, and many more to kind of provide deeper insight based on your needs. Well, the point is you're in full control of what gets exposed. Only expose what you need and hide everything else. Now, when I mention this, a common reaction I get is, well, instead of selectively exposing endpoints, why not just expose everything and just secure the endpoints with authentication? Ensure that only authorized users have access to them. But this is definitely a valid approach. And even if you expose these endpoints using this property, you would still want to make sure that only authorized systems have access to this. Just because you set this property and expose an endpoint doesn't mean it's public. However, just turning off the endpoints that you don't think you need just reduces the overall attack surface area for your application. You just don't have to worry about it anymore because it is cut out at the root. So if you turn off APIs that you just don't want exposed, you avoid any chance of unintended information leak via that API, all right? So having authentication is definitely a possibility and sometimes even a requirement, but just providing the selective exposure just is a simple approach in all these cases. So at number eight, we have this actuator property that brings smart control over what actuator endpoints you need to expose. And with this, we round up our list of eight essential Spring Boot properties that you absolutely have to know. Now, before we wrap up, I wanna highlight one bonus property, which isn't as widely used as of me recording this video right now, but it's an important property for you to know. It's a feature that's available from Spring 3.2 onwards. It's spring.threads.virtual Dot enabled. This is one property that turns the switch that enables your whole Spring app to use virtual threads. Virtual threads are a new Java feature that lets you decouple your application threads from underlying operating system threads. So using it makes your threads consume much less resources so you can have way more threads going on at the same time. Drop a note in the comments if you want a tutorial video about virtual threads in Java. It's a very important concept for you to know. So if virtual threads are so powerful and efficient, what do you as a Spring developer have to do to use them? Well, just use this property. Say you have a Spring MVC project where new requests spawn new native threads, right? If you drop this property into your Spring property file, all those threads are now automatically switched to virtual threads, right? Spring is going to do that switch internally and you don't have to do or change anything else, right? But be careful with this though. You don't wanna use virtual threads for all use cases. There are certain instances where using virtual threads can actually hinder your performance. You gotta be careful, but if you wanna use virtual threads throughout your app, this one property does the trick. It's super handy.